am I am I yep okay there I am I was like oh shit is my stuff not my is your thing fucked up? audio waves weren't showing up I thought it was but whatever it's good it's good now all right hello good morning everyone welcome back to another episode of the failed award contender season three episode five I think we're on right. four four we did all right we did we, we did Babylon yes. We did uh, Truman Show. We did Fargo. And we did Fargo. Yes. And so, and now, so, so that's four. So we're four in. Yeah. I'm your host, Diego Crespo. That was Macaringo. Yes. My other host, the co-host. It all kind of blends the together host. so far because I've, I've derailed multiple episodes just to talk about other bullshit. So it's hard to remember yeah, what but... movies we've actually covered. But look, we're here to talk about Citizen Kane. Um, the first episode we did this season was on a movie we didn't like, but we got a lot of mileage out of. The next episode is out of a movie we both really like. Uh, definitely a favorite of mine. Mm. Um, and we got a lot of mileage out of that episode. Fargo. We both liked a lot. Uh, also, I think a favorite of both of ours, safe to say. Yeah. Um, I, I, there's just no way of knowing how we feel about Citizen Kane, directed by Orson Welles. Yeah, so. who who knows how where we're gonna land on this one, Matt? Before we get into our opinions on this this does film, any, does Citizen Kane. Anyone other than David Fincher have a like Citizen Kane secretly sucks take? That would be crazy if it was like I have something to tell you after all these years. <laughs> it's like I actually I I don't like Citizen Kane. Yeah. I just don't I don't get it. No, um, no. no, everyone knows where we stand on this. We we're we're both like you more so by a significant margin, but we we have both Orson posted before yeah. on Twitter. So well, Orson just is just such a fascinating figure. I'm such an Orson head. Here's here's something kind of funny. Um, my my fucking father. Got me the same Orson Welles book two years in a row for Christmas. He That's for- incredible. He had forgotten he got it for me. Um, so, like, I opened, I was like, you got me this last year. <laughs> <laughs> Although my my dinner with Orson book, which is just the interviews with him just shit talking everyone. Uh, but uh, um, this movie on the poll that we ran for this season of the retrospective, it beat the whale. At seventy six percent against the whales twenty four percent. Um, I mean that was uh, that's, that's yeah. That's... I mean I kind of saw that coming. Mm-hmm. It is that it is that classic one though where I think that just polls like people defer to the better movie, right? Like that's what it mm-hmm. seems to be yeah. anyway. And uh, so it was like the whale had no chance, but uh, probably the more interesting movie to talk about, frankly, would have been the whale. Uh, Here's a hot take though. I'm not sure. I'm not sure if Citizen Kane is my favorite movie from 1941. There's a hot take. Oh shit. So. Wait, wait. Do you want to say that now or do you want to get into our history with Citizen Kane and Orson Welles? Um sure, sure. We can get into that. Um All right. I'll let you go when first. Did you normally, first watch? No, no, you go first this time. I'm usually the one that's like that like leads this shit. So oh, okay. Yeah, I didn't watch this till I was I was probably like 18 or 19. Um that I've, I've talked about my history with like discovering Nosferatu on YouTube clips after getting into it on SpongeBob because I'm like, what the fuck is Nosferatu? Like everyone in our generation. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, and then like discovering silent film and like, oh, what's Man on the Moon? Oh my gosh. Oh. Um, and oh, black and white movies actually kind of go crazy hard if you find the right ones. Um, and many of them still do, frankly. Uh, and then eventually you hear like, what, you know, you do the IMDb top hundred and what's the best movie ever made. And it's like Shawshank Redemption. I'm like, Oh, I've seen that. That is a great movie. It's pretty good. Um, and then, uh, eventually you just, you discover Citizen Kane. Everyone mentions Citizen Kane's the greatest thing since mm-hmm. the invention of. So that's how, so you would have found it through the IMDb list. That's how you heard for the first time. It was like considered one of the greats. IMDb and then my endless obsession with Roger Ebert as a film critic mm-hmm. and and then I just discover like he does that commentary for it and um did you listen and, to it uh, for uh, this every episode? every critic and every I, I I listened to it a while back actually yeah because I hadn't listened to it uh before but I I was like well we're doing Citizen Kane I got yeah. I got to listen to it and it is honestly such like a treasure trove of insight it's and a history. great it's a great um, commentary. Uh-oh. 
it is one of the best commentaries you'll ever listen to. I almost want to say, put it off if you want to like have something special to look forward to. But fuck it, just listen to it. It's fantastic. Is it on? Here's something um, though. I don't have because the like, Criterion put out the 4K Citizen Kane, right? Um, like, mm-hmm. like a little. Is it on that version? Because I, my, I, I have the Blu-ray from like ten years ago. Um. Uh, I, I I found it somewhere else. Okay, <laughs> okay. I'm not, I'm not judging. Yeah, um, it is it is available on YouTube. Um, unless it gets taken down, you know I what? will link it, it in the show notes. The, the Ebert commentary. Uh, the Ebert commentary. I went looking for it. I couldn't find it, so I must have not searched it correctly. Because um, I was gonna just. I will. I was gonna I put listen it in to your it. DMs right now. No, no, it's fine. I was gonna just listen to it while I was driving around today because I was doing shit. So, um, mm-hmm. but I did listen to it fairly recently. I did a thing where, like, I was watching. I, for some reason, I was like, I'm gonna watch a bunch of movies from 1941, and like, so this came just one of them. And like, I watched it, and then I just did the Ebert commentary and then the Bogdanovich commentary, just like, like back to back. Oh, so, nice. Just to be like, fuck it, like, because it was interesting. Um, and I, I have that. that Am whatever. I mistaken or? What were you saying? Real, really quick, am I mistaken, or is there a Guillermo del Toro commentary? Did I did I like fucking dream hmm. that? Or that, is that sounds like it would exist, but I don't. I don't think the version I have had the del Toro commentary. Yeah. So. Okay. No. 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 I, I haven't. I'm not claiming to have heard something. That's why I'm like. I feel like that exists, but I don't know why yeah. I feel that. Apart from him just being like one of the biggest champions of cinema ever. Yeah. Also, <laughs> you know. Although, uh, have you ever listened to a Guillermo del Toro commentary for one of his own movies? Uh, Blade Two, mm-hmm. which is hysterical. Yeah. Now, I don't know if he does it in this one, but on his other movies, this is this is my impression of Guillermo del Toro's commentaries for his movies. Now, this shot was very important to me, and he says that at, at the beginning of every shot in the movie, and he just does that for two <laughs> hours. Oh, you know what? I, I his specific rim commentary. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's the one where he he basically might as well fucking trademark this when he's like, I, I don't call it eye candy, I call it eye protein. <laughs> you know? I think that's where it first pops up, and well, then he like, says it about every movie. His, his, which he's not wrong to say. Yeah, yeah. You know? his, th- his commentaries are very funny because he does give really good insight, but then also times he's like, yes, I was kind of inspired by a sports movie, which is why they're, like, doing athletic things. I'm like, yeah, I got that one. <laughs> I picked up on that one, Del Toro. But his commentaries are fun, though. He's he's good. Um, but uh, his Blade Two one is really fun because he even he even does commentary for at least one deleted scene where he's like, oh, it's so post coital. <laughs> like, dude, I gotta like, see if if he did one though for Susan Kane, I gotta hear. I would listen to him talk about anyone's movies. Like, he is one of those guys where he is so infectious in discussing film that um any, oh anything. yeah no there's even like like even on film twitter I, I probably brought this up before there are people that don't think he's very good mm-hmm. at directing or at the very least has lost a step mm-hmm. since moving to digital can't imagine why um i i obviously disagree mm-hmm. anyone who's ever listened to this podcast before um but even like his biggest like naysayers are like but he i would listen to him talk about anything mm-hmm. like that dude i don't know if anyone else living loves movies like he does yeah frankly yeah i would agree um but yes and you know the other you know the other crazy thing about uh the ebert citizen kane commentary is that's what they used to recreate roger ebert's voice when uh he uh he couldn't talk for the last few years of his life um oh it was like any commentary track he did so like it was like that and like because i think ebert also has a commentary on uh dark city he was like a huge champion of that movie, so uh, he uh, they 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 I, he wrote a whole article about it when he was still alive of them like trying to recreate it, and he said like they thought they could use old ass episodes of Siskel and Ebert, but there was like constant like background music and shit, so it was basically unusable. And then they were like, oh, we can do the commentary track, so they took the commentary and they kind of used that to help recreate his voice so for like the last few years when he typed into the thing it could it could sound like him he didn't always use it but he could use it if he wanted to so uh which is just kind of interesting um and this weird like it's this weird Roger Hebert's relationship with cinema is kind of fascinating when you think about it that like in a way it came back into his life to give him his voice back in a in a very circular way 
Um, Whoa. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, did, that's, that's a did you see that quote? A statement. Did you see that quote going around of like Ebert in the last days? Did you see this? I don't think so. Someone like was like some friend of Ebert's was like I talked to Ebert like a few days before he died, and he was like at first I thought he was like he wasn't with it, but then like I realized he like he, he I was like what's going on? He's like I think I'm going to a different world. And he's like, what do you mean? And he's like, it's somewhere where everything is happening simultaneously. And like, that was like the last communication he had with this guy, like three days before he died. And it's like, wow, it's like, you know what? If that's Ebert's review of the afterlife, I feel a lot more comfortable. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we, we brought it up a bunch, but, like, that Onion headline after his death. Yeah, yeah. Like... Roger Ebert hails existence a triumph. Um, yeah. But, yeah, yeah. Like, the one, like, the one sweet Onion headline. <laughs> but. Yeah. And, like, what's that quote, too? It's like, oh, like, you know, a little messy, rough around the edges, yeah, but ultimately less... worth it or something. Yeah, well, he was like, it was a, a little long at times, but it could have gone on much longer and he would have been very happy like yeah it's yeah it's it's uh, it's an insane it it's an insanely sweet onion article like which is just not what you said again i always bring up to the uh the, the when when george harrison died their headline was ringo next so <laughs> <laughs> that's the normal speed of the onion <laughs> oh god damn. oh fuck that's good that is funny uh but, uh, all right. Um, but what is your history with Citizen Kane? Well, all right. So, like, uh, we have a different history with film just because, like, I think, I like, I just, I grew up in, like, a film-loving family, right? So, like, yeah. and, and um, so I was introduced to a lot of movies. You know, not, like, I, I wasn't being shown, like, fucking, um, I don't know, like, fucking High Sierra when I was six or something like that. But just, uh, I just, I lived in a family that talked movies. And my grandfather... Um, who was like really into Westerns. He used to talk to me about movies cause he knew I liked them. And, um, he, you know, it was something we could relate on. And one day he's like, you know, there's a movie, um, called Citizen Kane that some people consider the greatest movie of all time. And it's about a guy running a newspaper. I'm like, why would that be the greatest movie of all time? <laughs> like, I kind of had that reaction to the kid, but also you have that, you know, um, We've talked we talked about this. I don't know if you relate to this, but when you're like a really little kid and someone goes to you like this movie is like the scariest movie of all time, or this movie's a masterpiece. The version of the movie you imagine in your head almost like transcends what a movie is, right? Like you're mm -hmm. like, oh, if Citizen Kane, it's about a guy running a newspaper and it's considered the greatest film of all time, it must be a movie that like your brain explodes when you watch it, right? Like it must do something to the human body. That, like, you just don't understand when you're a child. Like, you're like, this must be something beyond that. And then you watch and you're like, oh, no, it's a movie. Like, it's not not a movie. Um, but uh, it's so like it kind of it was just like a thing. He just told me about it. And I just always stuck in my head being like, how is the greatest movie of all time about a, a fucking guy running a newspaper? And then I think the yeah. other thing we both have to relate to is that I believe technically our introduction to Orson Welles is uh the brain of pinky and the brain um voiced by maurice lamarche God, i forgot Did about you... that that's, that's yeah so fucking funny but like that's it, it was is that your technically your introduction to orison wells like yeah i guess so so um... yeah, do what we do every night pinky <laughs> <laughs> oh man what a great show um but I'm trying to think, like, looking at Orson Welles, because Orson Welles dies in, like, 85, right? So mm -hmm. it's, it's like, he's he's way out of the picture long before any of us exist. And I was not, like, I was not a Transformers kid, so, like, I didn't have that angle to it. I'm trying to think of, like, what my genuine... Oh, oh, all right, so the other one is I knew of the uh, the famous War of the Worlds broadcast. Right. So like probably yes. the first thing I was ever introduced to of Orson Welles that was directly Orson Welles was probably listening to that broadcast on like Google video back in the day um, of like someone uploading the War of the Worlds broadcast. So that's probably my I that's remember. probably the first Orson Welles thing I ever 
like was exposed to. I definitely saw that after, or I definitely uh, like heard that after I saw Citizen Kane. Mm -hmm. Um, but I do remember that, like, like hearing about that for the first time when I was like in high school, because that's when I'm Mm -hmm. learning about media and stuff like that and the history of that stuff. Oh, and uh... And I was like, oh well, you could like like back in the day, people used to mistake certain like uh, a radio stories for like real events Mm -hmm. and um uh, i actually had this teacher who since passed away uh rest in peace mr trollson um that dude he looked like fucking red foreman and he he (laughs) always had a pipe on him and he fucking smelled like it all the time oh my god sweetheart of a man though real real great stand-up guy um i hope i hope his his family um carries his memory like a blessing uh really really just one of the best people ever. Um, but he was the one who was talking about how, like, oh, yeah, like, or Orson Welles and, like, the we, we were hiding under the beds, under the bed sheets. We got so scared. <laughs> and I was like, like, I swear to God, think of, like, the most stereotypical, like, old-timey yeah, talk yeah. radio voice ever. That's him. That was him. <laughs> um, and so that left an imprint on me, obviously. And then... As I get older, and then I eventually do watch Citizen Kane. I'm like, oh, is he just he just talks like these people. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just, yeah. <laughs> I, the it's other him. one, just... I almost forgot. He's Lou Lord in the Muppet movie at the very end. So like, I saw that as a kid. So that was probably the other Orson Welles thing. But like, without knowing who he was, oh, just him being like, get the rich and famous contract for the Muppets. It's like his one line. <laughs> oh. And then history of the world he's the narrator for history of the world part one so like that's in there somewhere um but uh yeah also also like there's a whole thing about that broadcast where like how much did people really panic is a debate you know like yeah yeah there's a lot there's a lot of stuff about like orson kind of played it up because he knew it was good publicity and you can watch <laughs> interviews with him it's kind of hysterical like fucking 20 year old orson just being like, well, we did not intend to shock the nation in such a way. Like, he's so, like, trying to play, like, that he's, like, like trying to be apologetic, but it's so clear he's loving it. Like, yeah. it is such a, like, <laughs> a kid who's, like, gotten in trouble, but, like, is secretly proud of what he did. Um, but there's also the insane thing of, like, other news stations have redone uh, the Orson Welles broadcast, like, either re-aired it or... Uh, did their own version of it, and it ha- it has still caused a panic. Like in other countries, they have done the broadcast even as like late as like the '90s, and it still caused a panic, which is kind of crazy to think about. That's so uh, awesome. Yeah, maybe then art also, can change the world. And, make and then us I was fucking terrified. I was also the reason I was in is I was like a science fiction kid, and then like when the when the Spielberg War of the Worlds was coming out, like I got really into hg wells and shit like that so like like the moment the moment the spielberg war of the worlds is announced i get like super into it um and i'm like reading all the books and that's where it's just, and like i was confused about like is hg wells related to orson wells and they aren't but like um i think they, <laughs> i think they only met like once i think that's the other thing is that like way after the events they met like one time in like texas or some shit but uh uh it's yeah, so that was probably. Do you remember? Also, here's something. I don't know if it's still up. It might not be, but um, someone in like the ancient days of YouTube took the Orson Welles broadcast and like made a movie using like action figures as the <laughs> characters, um, and like recreated the whole thing and like uploaded it to like YouTube. And I'm talking like year one YouTube, um. No, it, I, I never I, saw that, but I did see re- recreations in like um, I guess what what we used to be called like Mat Machinima. I don't know if people remember. Oh this. yeah, yeah, Machinima, yeah, Machinima, yeah, yeah. Not even specifically the brand, um, mm. but just like the idea of like oh, machine cinema. Uh, that's what it was short for. For like you you record footage in a game you're playing, generally like in a multiplayer type space or whatever. Mm. Um, and you can like you can edit it into a movie basically mm-hmm. using the software that you just have uh, at, at your hands at your disposal and mm-hmm. controller. Um, and then eventually that gets to people get like messing around with stuff like Gary's Mod and Team Fortress yeah, yeah. Two and all that jazz. But I must have seen stuff like that uh, with um, 
uh, the War of the Worlds stuff because I I have like memories of stumbling upon uh, stumbling upon like versions of that, but not with mm-hmm. action figures, you know. But I I must have because I I it's just so well, there prevalent was such in a... my mind at this point. There was such a because of the Spielberg movie. There was such a like War of the Worlds boom that like I even remember. I bet it doesn't even exist anymore. But someone did a like chapter by chapter flash animation parody of War of the Worlds, and I think they only did like the first five chapters. Like I don't think they got very far, but it was it was. I remember watching it back in the day, and I doubt it exists in any form online i wouldn't even know how to find it right like it was uploaded to like a war of the worlds fan site that doesn't exist anymore and like it, yeah there's there was so much pressure. now do you so like you've listened to it, do you do you remember what the second half of the war of the worlds drama is because everyone knows the radio broadcast version right uh mm-hmm. everyone knows that do you know what the second half is I have no recollection of the second half, so maybe the that, second, I, I am much more yeah. of a simpleton. <laughs> no, no, no one really remembers, because the second half is literally just Orson as, like, one of the professors and, like, narrating, like, his experience of, like... It, th- that is much more like a first-person narrative of him being like, okay. as I as I wandered the countryside, the devastation of the Martian invasion. Like, it's a lot more stuff lifted directly from the uh, the novel. Uh, but yeah, it was that thing of like, he used like real locations, Grover's Mill, New Jersey. You can actually go there. It's not too far from where I live. You can like, like it's like a three hour drive maybe of like, and like they have a plaque of like where the Martians technically landed and shit like that. Um, and which is pretty cool. Uh, and then as for Citizen Kane itself, I cannot remember exactly when I first watched it, but it's that weird thing of like. I think I had I had I had saved it, and there had been the like waves of it's the greatest movie of all time, and then it's like well only like nerdy intellectuals like it. The movie's actually boring, and like I had heard like those takes, and then I watched Citizen Kane, and it's like Citizen Kane is one of the most like easily watchable movies of all time. Like it is yeah. not it is not like what would be like a more like you know like I'm not like this isn't like like a what they call like like a fanny twitcher like something like a boring fucking like movie that like we maybe love but also we can understand why it would be harder for a general audience to penetrate right like what would be a better example of that uh like from 1941 or no just from like any classic movie like any movie that like it's on like the afi top 100 but if like i tried to show a friend of mine they would be bored out of their tears Hmm. God, um, I I would say I think Blade Runner, the rhythms of that movie. Yeah, Blade are, Runner. That's like forty years after people. this, but I think yeah. the rhythms of that movie, considering its reputation and the poster, like yeah. I showed it to a friend when we were like nineteen or twenty, and I had just seen it like when I was seventeen or eighteen. Like, I mm-hmm. instantly fell in love with that director's cut. Um, it took them another viewing to watch before twenty forty nine came out, so they could come around to it because they were yeah. like, "Oh, I thought like." Akira from the poster. You yeah. Know I mean? Like something yeah. that fucking moves. And that movie doesn't. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Which is why I love it. <laughs> I guess you could throw like 2001 A Space Odyssey in there. Although I watched 2001 A Space Odyssey as a kid and loved it. So, like, I don't know if I was just mm-hmm. a fucking nerd, but like, you know, certain movies. I don't know. Like, there are movies that have that reputation where, like, you can kind of get it, right? Like, where people go, like, like or it's like, yeah, I get why general audiences maybe aren't super into it. Um, yeah. um if, if you're not as well I versed with movies. I, I, but... I have not um how do I put this? I did not like Wild Strawberries that much when I first saw it. Okay. Yeah. I mean a lot of Bergman and... shit is kinda like that. Like you know. Yeah. So but I can see I, I that. do worship like Persona and the Seventh Seal. Yeah, so. <laughs> I probably you know I probably saw Seventh Seal a little early, but like on rewatch, I was kind of like, oh yeah, now now I get it a lot more, right? Um, oh, or like, you know what else? Um, this is maybe more niche, like uh, mm-hmm. classic uh, cinema, but like anything by Tarkovsky, I know people, yeah, are like, like they 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 tend to bounce off it a little bit more now. Well, foreign films and I'm are like, like fuck yeah. <laughs> 
Not to be like American centric about it, but like foreign films always will have that challenge, right? Where like Seventh Samurai is like a great, like awesome movie, but you know, if you're not into foreign films, it's probably a bit of a drag. Like, yeah. it's. I, mean, I also call those people racists. But... Well, yeah. No, but... that's not true. I... Not, not everyone. Not everyone. Yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, I'm just I'm just talking about like the average person, right? Like, if you go to someone and they're like, "This movie is one of the greatest movies of all time," and you put it in front of them, and like, it's one thing to be like, "Okay, maybe they're not going to think Citizen Kane is the greatest of all time," but like, the idea of them being bored is kind of like baffling to me. I, I just it's 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 a two hour movie and it doesn't feel it, you know? Like it is, yeah. it's a fucking mover of a movie, and. Um, uh, yeah. I want to shout out uh, Letterbox, Twitter, pal, uh, Silent Dawn, uh, first mm-hmm. name Will, because um, he has uh, just a one paragraph uh, uh, Letterbox post about the opening of Citizen Kane, just to establish for people that haven't seen Citizen Kane, like just how efficient the movie is. Um, so this is from Silent Dawn. I'll link his review in, in the description as well. Um all right, so, quote, uh, greatest opening in cinema history, the no trespassing sign, the camera tracking upwards as the fence scales higher and higher, almost to the clouds, dissolves upon dissolves, inching ever so closer to Xanadu, a mansion and a castle, a fortress and a paradise, something out of horror and fantasy and adventure, seemingly all at once. The light from the window remains stationary, signaling to the spectator that our story begins in that high tower a sole fragment of warmth amidst the vast canvas of fallen excess, and the dissolve after the bedroom light goes out and the composition switches from exterior to interior, illuminating Kane's figure laying on the bed as another dissolve brings the audience into his final moments. An experiential flourish of understanding this man before we even know who he is. Scattered flurries, a childhood memory made tangible, the last gasps of air before the fall of a titan, decrepit and alone. Rosebud. That's how you start a fucking movie. The rest of the movie's pretty good too, I guess. <laughs> End quote. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't understand how anyone could call this movie boring. I think there's definitely like, especially now, just the way medium and art moves at, a, at such a <laughs> rapid pace. Like, you see something old and black and white, you assume like stilted. I guess. Yeah. Like, there's literally I, no color to it, so you assume, like, oh, well, it's not that exciting. And it's just, I that's just guess. not, it's categorically untrue, you know? But, like, I'm just saying, if you're if you're someone where, like, you are bothering to look up what the AFI Top 100 is or something like that, right? Like, if mm-hmm. you're in if you're in that pocket, I can't imagine Citizen Kane at least, at, at, like, a bare minimum not being engaging, right? Like, yeah. I, I just, I, I just, I find that hard to believe, um, but... It's, yeah, it's, it's such a, it's, uh, yeah, we're, we're, we're going to struggle just because, like, everyone's already said everything great about this movie, you know? Yeah, it's Citizen Kane, like, it, although, people call although, it the I, best movie ever made for a reason. Can I, can I bring something up that, like, has bugged me for, like, my entire life? And my entire life, I mean, yeah, since I was, it. like, 14? All right, so, like, fucking, remember Crack.com, where, like, they would do those, like, fucking great movies with plot holes in them type shit, right? Oh, yeah. That, do you, do you remember the one they did for Citizen Kane? No, I'm kind of glad I don't. And I bet it's I'm going to get really mad when you remind me right now. It's the dumbest one imaginable because the, 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 the essential one is like, who heard him say Rosebud? He died, right? Like, how does everyone know that he said Rosebud? And the opening of this movie is literally him saying Rosebud and a nurse coming in to check on him. Like, the nurse heard him. It's right there. <laughs> like, yeah. that's who heard him say <laughs> Rosebud. Like... It's so how the fuck it's it's bugged me for like years, man. Like it's it's one of those where it's just like just watch the movie. <laughs> but then you can't be snarky and use that as a veil of intellectual thought. Yeah. I mean, because, look, see, the real were... purpose of art is to outsmart it. Yeah. You have well, to every... prove to people that you're better than it. These are movies that they're, they're problems to be solved, Diego. They're puzzles, you know, mm-hmm. like the jigsaw puzzle in Citizen Kane. So we got if we put it, if we put it together, we will finally understand them. We will finally know what's going on deep within the psyche of Citizen Kane. Um, but you know, hey, 
Uh, I always think the, the thing, I, there was some other movie that did something similar to this, and now I can't remember what it is, but it's the thing I always like about Citizen King, where we, you have that great opening, he dies, and then they immediately just tell you his whole life. Like, mm -hmm. they're like, yep, he was born, here's what he, like, it tells you the whole movie, right? It's like, we, we learn the whole thing in just, like, the most boring and clinical way possible. So, like, it gives the whole, oh, you know what it is? It's fucking Titanic. Titanic <laughs> does this exact same thing. Where there's the whole scene where the guy like does the digital recreation of the sinking, right? Like that mm -hmm. whole opening of Titanic is like, yeah, the ship sank, sank, but like what fucking bullshit, right? Like it's a bunch of people being like super cynical and clinical about it. And then you go into like this flowing romance take on it. And so Citizen Kane does the, basically the same thing with its opening of just... Yep, here's here's was this guy's whole life. He did all this shit, and then news <laughs> on the march. Like, it's it's one of my. Although, <laughs> maybe look, I'm just, maybe I'm just ignorant of like what the times were back then. The fucking who was taking the handheld video of Kane in his pleasure garden that is part of the newsreel? Like, who was doing that back then? I know, I... like like. That is not a judgment on film. Like it's just like I was just I, I was I was like did that exist back then? Maybe I'm just ignorant, but it feels like how did anyone get that footage? Or maybe it was like I think a, a comparable uh, uh, film to uh, Citizen Kane, OJ Made in America, which I oh think is an, uh, one of the other great American tales. Uh, there, remember that scene in it where OJ. Because like he's he's basically lost all his money post the trial and like he's been sued by everyone, and he is he has to sell Rockingham. Do you remember this in the documentary? And then he yeah, yeah, yeah. realizes he can make money selling photos of himself to like the the gossip columns, like to the fucking uh, tabloids. So he has his assistant like role play as like a photographer sneaking on as he's taking the flag down. At Rockingham, so it's OJ like taking the flag down, and his assistant like taking photos of him. OJ being like, "Come on, guys, I'm just I'm, I'm trying to have some privacy here." And they do it like over and over again, and then he sells the photos. Like that's an insane moment. Um, yeah. <laughs> OJ, maybe a maybe maybe there's some screws loose up in OJ's head when you really think about it. I don't I don't mean to be I don't mean to judge a man with all the facts uh, not not concrete, but uh you know maybe I, there might be some things going on with oj simpson he's out of prison right You're, he's on twitter right he's out of prison the he's juice twitter, is loose yeah. I, I i heard he has a really killer social media presence hey <laughs> thank you that was really hard not to crack while i was saying that one murder is now legal in the state of california <laughs> <laughs> damn it <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, what's that the is a norm? little bit like, what's like the OJ norm? Citizen Kane. <laughs> yeah. No, I, 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 I think in I wrote a review years ago of OJ Made in America where I compared it to Citizen Kane, where I'm just like, it is it is a real life just like rise and fall narrative of like a guy like who when you look at him, you're like, is this guy as simple as he appears to be, or is he much more complex, right? Like mm -hmm. that that's the question I think with both Kane and uh and OJ, it's like, like, do we have them figured out, or is there much more going on than we realize? Right? It's, it's. I think the the constant debate. Um, but yeah, goddamn, it's Citizen Kane. Yeah, uh, hot take: Citizen Kane, good movie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's a fucking. It's a it's a struggle to to bring anything new to the table. But I think we talk now, around a little bit. So. Now, have you have you ever seen the trailer for Citizen Kane? You know what? I swear to God, I have. It's just been so long, uh, and I, I should have looked it up beforehand. I would this. argue it's gonna go in the beginning of this episode. I should yeah, have watched it before. Well, the only problem is it's it's one of those trailers where it's like five minutes long because that's how trailers used to be back then. And mm -hmm. uh, but it's it. I would argue it's one of the greatest movie trailers of all time as well. Uh, where it's just like you know, it's Orson being like, "Ladies and gentlemen, this is Orson Welles, and I would like to tell you about my upcoming picture, Citizen Kane." And like he slowly goes through and like introduces all the different actors and shit like that. And then it's like clips of people being like, 
I would say Charles Foster Kane is a communist. I would say he's a fucking fascist. Like it's a lot of that. And mm. um, it's a really, it's Orson well Welles being like, and here we have some singing girls performing <laughs> ballet. Like it's, 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 it's what you'd want from a fucking Orson Welles narrated movie trailer. Uh, but God, it's, I mean, it I, is, I wish he narrated every trailer. It's okay. so, there is something so sad about like, I kind of like, like there is such Orson Welles is like arrogance is so caught up with Citizen Kane. Like you could tell he was like, once they see it, it'll be an undeniable masterpiece. And then like, it kind of ruins him. Right. Like, mm-hmm. it, like this, like it, it's, it's this, he picked a fight with a guy he couldn't ultimately beat. Um, and it just, it kind of, he never, this is, this is uh, in terms of mainstream, this is the peak of Orson Welles. Right. Like, yeah. Now, like, we would probably say he made better films after Citizen Kane, correct? Like, I think we would we would maybe say that. Um, I, you know? I would argue it. I, I don't know how hard I'd commit to that argument. And I only say that because Citizen Kane's so fucking good. Yeah. But he's got, like, three other masterpieces. Yeah. Well, so. it's great until, I mean, Other Side of the Wind's great, right? Like, we're both big defenders of Other Side of the Wind. Like, it's great. But until yeah. Did Other Side of the Wind. I not realize it needed defending, frankly. Well, no, I'm just, I, no, I, well, for the point I'm making, which is you could have made okay. the argument that his first film or his last film was his greatest movie, right? Like, the other one mm-hmm. people really went to bat for is F for Fake, right? Like, yeah. people like F for Fake, it's like, like a, a movie like 10 years ahead of its time and it kind of is like effort fakes a masterpiece um mm-hmm. and then we also we benefit from the fact that we live in an era where it is much easier to get a hold of orson welles movies and his intended versions of them right yes. like uh yeah. famously like touch of evil was re-edited and then they they did a a subsequent edit after his death based only on his notes. And then you had like shit like the trial and my favorite chimes at midnight, which chimes at midnight, you just couldn't get in America for the longest time. I actually, I was reading an old Ebert review of chimes at midnight and he was like, it's a crime that this movie currently is out of print in America. And this was written in like the early two thousands. And it's cr- and it was one of those where, like that movie was straight up almost lost like we almost lost Chimes at Midnight because of like distributors and how poorly that thing was handled and I like I said I would argue that's his best movie and so like we 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 benefit from that I think that is what has partly uh, made Orson like the like I said the patron saint of film Twitter is we get to live in this era where we have more access to Orson Welles material than anyone has ever had. Um, whereas I don't know, I don't know what it must have been like if you are, you know, a film student in the seventies talking about Orson Welles, right? Um, mm-hmm. I mean, there's, uh, there's such a, there's that documentary, uh, the love me when I'm dead about the making of, uh, <laughs> of, uh, Other Side of the Wind. And there's that really sad moment where he, they give him the honorary Oscar, right? And he mm-hmm. basically uses his speech like in an attempt to like get money for the other side of the wind and it's like no one gave him fucking shit right like it's yeah it's yeah it's a, it's a real it's a real shame um fucking 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 industry um, i know I, I think that's why you and i specifically get so upset about mank a movie that is honestly yeah. not like the worst movie ever made yeah but it is bullshit yeah and it's like just hearing look look david fincher dude could turn out quality films uh, in his sleep at this point with like one exception. No. And he's definitely um, been sleeping lately, yeah. frankly. Oh, yeah. I, I haven't, I haven't seen it yet. They, now that I have Netflix again, they I'm definitely feel now. like a guy um, who is directing in his sleep. So, well, look, look, what, just when I hear someone of his caliber say like, well, you know, it's, it's very clear that like, you know, he peaked with Citizen Kane. I'm paraphrasing here, but he, he yeah. peaked Citizen Kane because um, it's the only one that was, that it, he had a co-writer on. Or whatever, uh, what, what he's you know he's he's hyping up the the collaboration with Herman J. Mankiewicz because well, well, in the run up to Mank, um, and uh, I just I I don't agree that it's where he peaked at all, even though it it might still be his best film. Um, well, I am more than willing to like engage in in other arguments because every time I see one, I'm like, 
maybe Chimes at Midnight's the best one. Maybe F for Fake. Yeah. Maybe um, it is speaking, the other side of the wind, even though he's dead. <laughs> you know? Speaking like, speaking of Chimes at Midnight, um, Chimes at Midnight did have a co-writer. Uh, a guy by the name of William Shakespeare. <laughs> what the fuck is David Fincher talking about? <laughs> Like, uh, yes, he didn't write the screenplay, technically, but fucking Orson did, like, three fucking Shakespeare adaptations. What the fuck is he talking about? I, I think he just means, like, a collaborator. Yeah, yeah, the fuck him. writing process. He, he, he can go fuck himself. Here's what he doesn't, here's what he really doesn't like, is that Citizen Kane is such a cheap-looking movie. Here's the here's here's the truth. When you watch Citizen Kane and you really pay attention to it, you realize that, oh, it is not... Lawrence of Arabia. It is not this massively. This is essentially an of its era. It is an independent film, essentially, in terms of how it is shot. You watch this fucking movie. You can tell it was done with like a small crew in small locations, doing everything they can to like maximize the limited resources they have. Right? Like mm -hmm. this movie, it feels it it feels a lot closer to shit like Reservoir Dogs or something like that, like early 90s independent cinema. Or even like, I would even say it feels closer to something like Evil Dead or Blood Simple, you know? Like mm -hmm. movies that are just maximizing their really small budgets. And I think that's what Fincher doesn't like about Citizen Kane because he's some psychopath who thinks like, oh, if I do a thousand takes and make... The I don't even know what he's trying to go for with his bullshit. And people like jerk off over some fucking shot of a building in the killer being like, wow, you must've worked forever on this. And I was like, who cares? Fucking airless nonsense. But, uh, it's, he, he well, does I mean, it. Cause like, look, we, we love, we love Orson. Obviously. No, but like, an uh, well, maniac the, of the, his own stature yes, as yes. well. It's um, not even, um, it's not even just the Orson thing about it. I just, I, I like cheaper looking movies is the truth. Like I think that there is more humanity in a film where you can see the fucking strings to it. And I think David Fincher in his quest for whatever nonsense perfection he's going for makes movies that feel like they're on the fucking moon. That is a lifeless, airless film. And I, I, I brush up against his entire philosophy of filmmaking at this point. Um, okay. so. I completely understand where you're coming from and ultimately I do like my interests in movies right now especially I am much more on your side than his I don't think his method is wrong striving for perfection probably how he gets there I disagree well, with well look there's um, another there's another I, filmmaker I, there's another filmmaker who <laughs> we will talk about later who all is a similar and uh, a movie that we are going to discuss uh, basically gives his philosophy I think on the striving for perfection type thing, Michael Mann, and he makes significantly better and more engaging films and doesn't lose grasp of that spirit of life that I think is completely absent from most David Fincher films in recent years. Well, to, I mean, to, to this point about like, um, like the strings and like the, the resources, uh, Orson has that quote from one of the documentaries. I think, I think it's for the trial, <laughs> right? Where he says, uh, uh, neither poverty nor, endless resources or platforms for creativity. Like it really is just about having like a time, a budget, <laughs> knowing mm -hmm. what you want. And Hey, look, like it's not like Orson always knew what he wanted or how to get it yeah. right away either. You know, like, uh, it's not like he also didn't wind, like those, he didn't overwork people. He was underpaying. <laughs> it's not like yes, he also yes, didn't it, do that. It, yeah. Uh, a patron saint doesn't mean he's a perfect saint, um, yeah. <laughs> but like, yeah, there there is something to just like the the humanity of that, and and again, not 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 a well, I, literal saint, I, but I, yeah, I think yeah. there's more I, to I his think, his stuff there. I think it comes from his experience in the theater, right? I think he brought a lot of that with him, and I think he, you know, there's the story of he tried to do a version of Chimes at Midnight, I think called Four Kings or something like that, um, on the stage, which was like he tried to do like a rotating set. And it, it just, it like didn't work, right? Like it, like he could, he basically got the theater working as fast as he possibly could um, before jumping the film. And I think that you can see that kind of carry over in the cinema in terms of how he uses the camera, right? That he's like, he yeah. knows what, where, where, what boundary the camera is ultimately pushing. Um, 
And that's what it, I think gives his movie such life, even to this day. Um, I mean, you, it's the thing of like Chimes at Midnight, like that movie, like comparatively was made for like nothing compared to like the other epics that we're having in its time. And people like still cite the battle sequences in that as like, that's how you shoot a battle on a low budget. Right. Like, mm -hmm. I think it was even, uh, um, the fucking game of Thrones people before that show went off the rails, but they were like, we use chimes at midnight as like a reference point for, uh, for the like earlier battles when they had no budget on game of Thrones. <laughs> Yeah, and you know what? To, to that show's credit, though, it uh, not to fucking talk about Game of Thrones tomorrow, yeah. but like the 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 battles themselves, I don't think ever looked worse. I I think they looked better as they went along, mm. um, or at least like in terms of scale, but, maybe not but until that last but scale, they had no season. Problems. Until that last season, like the last season, they just gave the fuck up. But we don't need to relitigate uh, uh, all of that. Uh, I I I think. Miguel Sapochnik goes fucking crazy with the spectacle in that season because that's all that season has to rely on is the spectacle. Uh -huh. That's what I'll say. Sure, you can we'll say that just because you would have to put a gun to my head to get me to rewatch the last season of Game of Thrones. So, sure. like, it, it, you know what? Better than season five and seven. That's my take. Not a defense, oh yeah, though. Your, please, no, not your... a defense. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm willing to give you five. Honestly, like just because five is. Such I a, almost a, stopped. A, yeah, five's a pretty. Big, a pretty bad season, but mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So. Uh, but I, we should to talk about scale some more. Um, yeah, I'm actually glad you brought up the, <laughs> the I guess the cheapness. It sounds like a, well, like, a, a criticism, like a no, no, criticism. But I it's not. love this kind of shit. My, my whole thing, that's my take on fucking everything, everywhere, all at once, too. Where I'm like, the that movie's the best when it looks the cheapest, right? Like <laughs> that movie's the best when you can tell it's just two idiots trying to make an action movie, <laughs> like it, yeah. It, whenever they like, whenever there's like a seamless effect in it, it's not as good as like just putting googly eyes on a rock. Um, but but I mean, and uh, it's like the emotional catharsis. Of yeah, the movie. it's like the biggest. It's like the moment where like it's great. Pe yeah. people who aren't on film Twitter will like be like, I sob uncontrollably at that scene, and yeah. I'm like, hey, I'm glad people are getting some catharsis somewhere in life these days. But like, there's the big scene where Kane's at his rally for his. Uh, you know, his, his, his election campaign, and they do that wide shot, right? Where it's like, you know, like, that's mm -hmm. all bullshit. But then when they zoom in, and it's just a close of them, and there's supposed to be a huge crowd there, and there's like maybe 12 people. <laughs> like, it's, you, <laughs> like, when you really look at it, it's like, there's no one in this movie. <laughs> it's just, it's such a smaller movie than they, and it, the fact that you don't really put it together, like, if you're really looking, if you're insane like David Fincher and are like really looking for it, and then if you're insane like David Fincher, you think it's a bad thing. Whereas I watch it and I just love it. Once you realize that it's like, oh, they have like ten extras this day, right? Like it's mm -hmm. it's all the same fucking people walking around, and uh, that's that's the kind of stuff I love in movies. Um, and I think people like kind of look at Orson as like a, like being super experimental. I just think he was just very good at like maximizing the small budgets he had. Right. Um, yeah. Like, I, I think the experimental wasn't out of like, it wasn't striving for like, yeah, like even breaking and remaking anything. It was just like, I can do this with mm. the little things I have right mm -hmm. here, right now. Let's do that. And mm -hmm. if we edit it this way and we cut these things together and put the sound in this capacity, we can make this sort of impact for the audience. Mm -hmm. And you know they, in a way, it is groundbreaking, but it's not like it, it couldn't have been stumbled upon by anyone else. Now, what makes him so special is that he did it first in a lot of cases, and mm. he did do it fucking remarkably well, if not perfectly, for yeah. the movie he was making here. Um, but I, I do find this movie also very inspiring because of like how small. Well, that's, it, it yeah, that's, that's the thing. I think the, the thing, if I have a take on it is that I want people to take, watch this movie and just be like, this is an independent film. Like, this is not it. Like, you know, there's so many great movies out there where it's like, you know, like Lawrence of Arabia or the Godfather, where like, they're just out of reach of someone who with very little resources. Right. You know? And yeah, I want to show, I want people to watch this game and be like, you can like, you can make Citizen Kane is the thing. Like, I think you could tell, mm -hmm. you could tell a film student, you can make Citizen Kane. And I think that's a good thing. 
I think you can be like, watch I think Orson Welles would have said the same thing, <laughs> frankly. What was that? I think Orson Welles would have said the same thing, yeah. frankly. Yeah, yeah. And it's like, it is not this out of reach object for you. It is not, it is not Kubrick, right? It is not like, you don't need the fucking bullshit Kubrick 200 IQ thing to make the movie. It is, you yeah. can be, you can, you know, you could be Soderbergh and like shoot it on an iPhone, right? Like mm-hmm. you could, you have more, there's more of a film studio on your phone now than Orson Welles had. So you, yeah. you can make this movie. And that's not me downplaying, you know, labor intensive costs of filmmaking. That's always a challenge, right? But it is not yeah, as yeah. far out of reach as I think some people, David Fincher, try to make it seem um, in, a, in a sense to, I think, glorify their own importance. But I, I, I think that you can, that this movie is, it's within reach of anyone who's ever dreamed of making a movie. And it should, I think that's beautiful in a way about cinema. <laughs> like, I think that, that the greatest movie of all time is made by a bunch of amateurs, frankly, <laughs> like yeah, that it was not someone who had been in the fucking industry forever. It was a bunch of outsiders with outsider ideas, including Mank. Like, you know, Mank deserves the credit too. Um, yes, yes, absolutely. But I want to downplay, you he know, gets, Greg. He shares the screen yeah. in the credits of the movie. Yeah. So that's why I never bought into the whole, like, oh, Orson's such an mm. egomaniac. He was trying to steal the credit. It's like and he's, also, he's like, sharing it in the edit. The other thing of him, like, basically deferring to Greg Toland on everything. Like, he would never stop talking about how useful Greg Toland was in terms of Citizen Kane, right? Like, mm-hmm. so it is such a, like, like, yes, Orson probably took more credit than he deserved on things, but he was, he, he didn't shy away from giving compliments. Like, he was just, he was, or- Orson was just a bit of a fucking brat and a sore loser. Like, that's really what it comes yeah. down to. Like, he's not as overly complicated as people think he is, but. Yeah. Oh, God I, damn, there's all these directions I could go right now, but I really want to mention it just because you brought it up right now. Um, <laughs> There's this interview, this old interview from the BBC with Orson Welles. You've probably seen it, and it's probably been shared a billion times on Twitter, but for people that haven't seen it, um, the interviewer is asking Orson, like, um, you know, what, uh, uh, how, how did you, how did you do this, basically? How did you, like, you would never step set on a, uh, on, on a set before, step foot in a, in a fucking studio, for the record, like, Citizen Kane's your first time directing anything in the motion picture business how and orson like flippantly is just like there's nothing about camera work that any intelligent person couldn't learn in half a day yeah and now, that might be a, a little a little flippant underselling it yeah um but, but that, so that much is... of it is just like mm-hmm. learning it by doing it and that yeah. includes failure he just happened not to fail here yeah but i, I think i think he's it's I think that's a better attitude. And then that is specifically a quote I found David Fincher being angry about. Oh, God. He was, like, he was very specifically like, that's idiotic to say you can learn all you need to learn about film in half a day. Like, he really didn't like that quote. Because um, fucking David Fincher's stroking it to himself on take 7,000. But, um, <laughs> you know, what are you going to do? Uh, it's, I, I, you know, whatever. Here's here's well, the thing. Here's, here. this, here's this the might... thing about David Fincher. Here's <laughs> here's the thing about David Fincher. With all his nonsense of working so hard and all the shit that you fucking film Twitter people fucking stroke each other over, why aren't his films the greatest movie of all, movies of all time? Well, some people think they are. No, they aren't. People <laughs> like his movies. People like his movies. No, he's never made a movie that you could consider the greatest movie of all time. Alien 3 is pretty good. Alien 3 is pretty good. I'll give him that. Um, <laughs> yes, also the movie yes. where he had the least amount of control over. So maybe that's saying something. But has he ever made a movie that you could that you could comfortably say is the greatest movie of all time? I'll say this. I think his run of Zodiac, Social no, gr- Network, Zodiac, and Gone Girl is fucking... Pretty- Zodiac? Great movie. Social Network, highly overrated. Gone Girl, pretty good. Uh, but uh, you, you you couldn't call any of those the greatest movie of all time. You couldn't. Now with I'm a str- about Gone Girl. That's, a, with that's a, street. a good fucking movie. Gone Girl's pretty good if you hate humanity. But uh, it's... I have mixed feelings sometimes. Uh, it's... 
you you're if if he's working that hard, he hasn't why has why hasn't he ever come close to making the greatest movie of all time? Well, here this this is another quote that will make you happy, and I'm sure made David Fincher very unhappy. Mm-hmm. Um, when then when the interviewer asked, like you know, he pushes like how how did you like do this? <laughs> um, Orson just says that like you know it's it's pure ignorance. It's like that's the greatest confidence. Like nothing else. Mm-hmm. Like if you know too much about something, <laughs> basically that you overthink it and like you you're you're too careful. Yeah. You have to be like like bold and ignorant in a sense. He's not saying be harmful. He's just you know. Was well, is Orson's entire career going... been in the face of that kind of like belief that you need to be an expert at things? Like maybe his, again another reason well, why he's probably the patron saint. Yeah, well, because also like effort fake is so much about like experts are bullshit just lie like lying will get you as far as being an expert right like Mm -hmm. it's it's i mean because part of that it's that 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 movie isn't just you know um about like the subject matter about like um like the fake like you know fake paintings and stuff like that it's a lot about him being like yeah like i just i fucking faked my way through the whole fucking thing like it's like i was full of shit i lied about my experience in the theater and they started letting me do plays <laughs> like it's it's and I, I i think i think that's really what he's saying is that like he just had that like kind of insane arrogance and confidence of just being like yeah i could do it even though he totally couldn't <laughs> like and then just through like sheer sheer just like i don't know what the word would be but he he just succeeded just going for it like he he i don't know i just it feels like he stands in the face of the idea that like, you need to be these like technical experts in order to make great movies. And I defer to that. And I don't, uh, not that I brush up, there are plenty of like technical filmmakers that I think make great movies and they put like their fucking, like I said, like Michael Mann, I would consider one of those and Kubrick, you know, Kubrick was one where like I started cooling on him and then I've kind of come back around. Um, Cause I think a lot yeah. of the Kubrick myths have overshadowed what Kubrick is actually good at. Um, and, uh, but like, yeah, it's, I, I think that I, I just defer to people. I defer to the idea of people just going like, let's just go out into the woods and fucking shoot a movie. Right. Like it's, I, that's, that's why evil dead is one of the greatest movies. Yeah. Made, I mean, it's frankly. why, it, it's why I love evil dead. It's just, it's why I love tech. Like, I mean, like, look, Texas Chainsaw Massacre is better than anything David Fincher has ever filmed. Right. <laughs> like, like it like laps David Fincher's entire filmography combined. Right. I like that this has just become a David Fincher hate podcast. Of course it is, because fuck that guy. No. But um, oh, look, look, I, wait, I also have to correct myself. Um, the the quote from Orson about how there there's nothing you couldn't learn from half a day at the camera. Um, that that was told to Orson by cinematographer Greg Toland. Okay. So well, it, Fincher didn't seem to get quote. that. <laughs> Fincher didn't seem to get that memo either. So, uh, <laughs> but like, am I wrong? Texas Chainsaw Massacre is like a masterpiece, right? And it was a it, bunch it, of. It is not like a masterpiece. It is a masterpiece. Yeah, it's it's it, and it's a bunch of fucking hippies going out in the middle of Texas, all dying of heat stroke, fo- not following union rules, <laughs> like like fucking violating union statutes, fucking like shooting twenty four hours, and they accidentally make like a cosmically brilliant film. And yeah, so don't necessarily do that. All no, the no, bad I'm not, stuff you that can't look. said don't do that. No, but no, do no. the other stuff. No, no, yeah. I'm not saying like you shouldn't you shouldn't set out to do that, right? Like yeah, you shouldn't yeah, set yeah. out to break that. Like, but like I'm just saying, if it happens, sometimes shit happens. <laughs> but yeah. no, I uh, mean, you're, you're arguing for the imperfections of creativity. Yeah, that it, it's just striving to create something in itself makes it like a worthy endeavor. Yeah, now. Again, and I know you're not saying like break the rules in spite of safety and stuff like that. Yeah, I'm but not that saying is something to keep yeah. in mind. No, no, yeah, it's, it's always not. Something. I know other people still. Might I'm just saying that like that recklessness. Suggestion. Like I'm not. I'm just saying that recklessness. I'm not endorsing it. I'm just saying that recklessness makes mm-hmm. better movies than like the like people who are like obsessed with perfection, right? Like, yeah. in my opinion. And there are people who are obsessed with perfection who also don't give a shit about their crews. Like that's not a mm-hmm. that's not a uh, one or the other type things. I mean, you could argue yeah. James Cameron falls a little bit under that at times. Yeah. Um, yeah. Man who works very hard to make movies and fucking gave everyone on the set of the Abyss PTSD. Um, <laughs> Jesus. But I mean, that's what shit happens, right? So. Mm-hmm. Um, 
Like I just say in, in terms of like what I like out of movies, I'm just I'm always gonna defer to the fucking people who don't really know what they're doing. <laughs> like, <laughs> um, I think they will ultimately. God make... damn, this is getting me so hyped. I'm gonna buy an Orson Welles shirt after this. Someone yeah. link me your favorite shirts with Orson Welles <laughs> on them. I, I need I need a new fit. Mm-hmm. I have no Orson Welles clothing. I don't I don't think he had a clothing line. Mm-hmm. So. Um, um oh, uh we should also mention the editor of the film. Yes. Uh Robert Wise. Uh, the great yeah, Robert Wise. The, the great Robert Wise. Mm-hmm. Um just if you don't know who Robert Wise is off the top of your head, it's totally fine. Give him a quick Google. Mm-hmm. Check out his filmography and you're like, "Oh shit." Yeah. <laughs> Whoa, one of the best to ever do it and yeah. maybe you didn't know about him, but he was. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, like fucking. I mean, Day of the Earth still is like a classic. Run Silent, Run Deep. I mean, you know, like just the haunting, right? Like these are like undisputed movies, and like they, like a very I mean, co-directed uh, a West Side Story. Yeah, and a very just like um, what would the term be? Like a very elastic career, right? Like he's he, he's a, mm-hmm. he not all is you wouldn't you wouldn't realize that the guy who did um, fucking the sand pebbles did curse of the cat people. Right. Like mm-hmm. it's just, you wouldn't, you wouldn't put those things together, but he did. And he did them both very well. Um, and there's not, we don't seem to have that many directors like that these days, kind of like Ang Lee, right? Like Ang Lee's a little bit like that yeah. where he feels very elastic as a filmmaker. Um, mm-hmm. But he's yeah. done like basically every genre at this point. You know? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I, like it's one of those things where like I like that too in a director where there's some guys like like those are the real like workhorse directors who are like I'm gonna try every genre, I'm gonna and like, they, yes they will have like they will have like certain obsessions but they don't let those obsessions kind of override the film a little bit right like, mm-hmm. um, you know they don't make this fucking same fucking boring point about killers and humanity over and over again like David Fincher might. <laughs> But, um, <laughs> Jesus, I'm sorry. I got like, I got such a fucking, I got a I know, phone. I thing. know. Um, I'm looking you know forward to was? checking out. You know the what killer. it was? I'm going to, I'm going to give it, I'm going to, I'm going to throw some people under the bus. Um, I fucking fell into listening to the blank check podcast mm-hmm. and, uh, they did They did because they were doing Park Chan Wook. So I listened to that and they took them the whole episode of old boy to fucking get why that movie was good. But anyway, um, and then their follow up was David Fincher, and like they're they're both like Fincher obsessive. So I was like, you know what, I'm gonna give this a chance to see if it can win me over on David Fincher. I'm like, I'm gonna see if these guys can like, cause like I you know whatever, like I don't know, like maybe maybe someone can make a good point on David Fincher. And I listened to their episodes, and I got to their Gone Girl episode, and uh, one of the guys in it was. Uh, was talking about like, and that was the screening I was at, 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 uh, I don't know, I think Tiff. He was like, yeah, I was seeing the screening of Gone Girl at Tiff. And that was when I realized later that Fincher was in the audience and they said it with such a tone of fucking Senpai Fincher was there and I didn't realize it. <laughs> and, and I was like, all right, I'm done. And I just stopped listening. <laughs> I like those guys. I don't have a beef with them, but I didn't that was, listen to that one. I, I tapped I, out I of like trailed off. I, I was like, you know what? They're not gonna win me over on Fincher. <laughs> I, I just and since then I've been like so annoyed whenever I think about David Fincher. So we should never release that Zodiac episode we did. No, we should. No, no, we should actually just redo it. Okay. We should do because I could do because I could genuinely do a JFK style episode on Zodiac. <laughs> I, I, I think we could. Uh, we'll, we'll explain what this is in the future. By the way, it's, um, it's it might you know what nothing, yeah. it m- might be up on the Patreon if you want to go check it out. Um, we might put it up there oh, at some point. Yeah, um, yeah. A, yeah, I think uh, I could do that. Be like, here, here's what we we worked on at one point. Yeah, uh, it didn't work out, and now we'll redo it again. Yeah. Yeah, fucking Joe, Joe Biden crashing this economy, costing us work. I mean, yeah. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Not to get into it, but... Um, I'm actually joking. I, I'll be honest. I, I, I'm, just, I'm joking. I don't actually blame Joe Biden. I just think the economy sucks. He's an asshole for being like, it's fine, actually. Like, that's where he sucks. But, no, yeah. Like, Even though he tweeted when he was running for president, only an asshole would tweet about how good the economy is while yeah. Americans suffer. Yeah. 
I mean, that's just <laughs> like, that's, well, but that's the pr- like, I've made this point. That's the president. He can't go on the air and be like, the economy's bad. Like, he can't do it. Like, it, it's, he would get blamed for, I told you, the one guy to do it was Jimmy Carter, and we never forgave him. <laughs> like, no, you know what? This, this is maybe not comparable, but it, the, Comparison jumped into my head anyway, so I'm going to make it. Did I ever tell you about the time um, there was a stabbing at my high school? I probably have. <laughs> you might have, but I'm, I don't know where it's going uh, in connection okay. to this. Um, so it's the middle of the day, right? It's like, uh, like I think we're even like late for lunch or something like that. I'm like, man, I'm in biology. The teacher's not letting us out yet. Mm-hmm. Um, and he looks <laughs> oh, like more frazzled than usual. And th- this this poor kid, he, he must have been like younger than I am now mm-hmm. teaching this class full of like dickhead high schoolers um mm. decent guy bad teacher both can be true right um mm. but clearly out of his element today and i'm like what the hell is going on and then i'm getting texts from I, I went to an all-boy high school gene did mm. too so this, this is how we met uh, all-boy catholic school um many people who attended are no longer catholic for no particular reason but um i'm getting no, no, texts from no, our sister schools for those no. that don't know sister schools are the all uh, uh female equivalent of mm. the same deal but uh, yes. what were you gonna say well i was just gonna say I, I i i've heard the argument that catholic schools make the best atheists like <laughs> i'm just like it yeah, feels like I, I think so i had a friend who went to so. catholic school and i didn't talk to him for four years and i reached out to him again i was like hey man how's how's uh how's catholic school going and he like he basically within like three text messages was like there is no god <laughs> like and this was a guy that i hadn't spoken to in forever and i was like well sounds like it's going good um, but sorry go back to your story <laughs> um and so um our teacher he was like trying to settle us down he's just not telling us anything he's like just stay seated stay seated sit mm. sit like that i mean the dude's probably having a panic attack or something right cuz he knows something's going on so wait we, wait the student body does not your, your school strategy during a stabbing was to not tell you there was a stabbing? I'll, I'll explain wh- okay. why in a okay. second. You know what? Not the worst situation at okay. this point. Because um, okay. this wasn't like a mass shooter thing. It was a single person got stabbed. Yeah, yeah. Um, but then I'm getting texts from my friends at my sister's school. And they're like, Are you, how are you doing? And I'm like, yeah, I don't know. I'm kind of bored. We're stuck in class. And then I'm getting <laughs> other texts, other texts. My parents try calling me and I'm like, they... They know, like, I can't pick up the phone. They know I'm in class. What the hell? And, like, I'm not saying that out of the goodness of my heart. Like, oh, it was goody two-shoes not texting in class. I mean, like, I physically cannot pick up the phone right there or I'll get it taken away again, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. And then uh, other friends are like, oh, my, we just heard what happened. Are you okay? And I'm like, I, everyone's asked me that today. I don't Am I giving off a vibe or something? And then they're like, oh, we heard there was, like, a shooting or something. And I was like, what? <laughs> and I'm not the only one with friends at other schools getting texts now and calls. So now it's like... The situation starts escalating really quickly, uh, and then, like the, uh, this poor guy is just like, "Look, we're all okay. No one has any reason to be concerned. We all just need to stay put. I promise, we're all okay, and there's no reason to leave." And we're like, "Okay, <laughs> I don't I don't hear anything." And then we start hearing helicopters and shit, and we're like, "Oh my god!" Eventually, they're able to cordon us off in to the uh the assembly hall to just announce that our our, our principal got stabbed <laughs> and uh, it was a student that stabbed him oh god um i promise this this part's actually a little funny he, he's fine no no everyone's uh, fine uh, diego um, diego you are not the person that you're gonna have to like be like now matt don't find this yeah. horrible <laughs> event <laughs> this, this, don't worry this is funny actually like i would have found it funny no matter what happened <laughs> okay so some background on this principal um he dressed like adolf hitler <laughs> oh boy <laughs> not intentionally but he had the comb over and a very um centered mustache oh my god how fucking what is he yeah you think he's michael jordan trying to bring the hitler mustache no back? uh <laughs> um he was, he was a, 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 we had this, we had like a, a defense against the dark arts teacher situation with the principals <laughs> in high school where every year was a different, I'm not even fucking joking. Um, so this was the second year replacement or sophomore oh, year. Uh, generally not a well-liked guy. Um, and he got stabbed in the back, but he would wear this school letterman jacket, right? Which he did not earn, and which was a big point of controversy with the teachers and the athletes that did. Um, and oh my I, I God. wasn't it, some star athlete. Isn't it I the was like, best, yeah, I get that. 
isn't it the best when you realize your teachers have no respect for the administration? Oh, isn't it, it, the, it was like it was I, like a whole new world opened up. Like to me. we in when I was in middle school, it, we had a principal who took over like my second year, and it was so clear the teachers had zero respect for this guy. Like yeah. he was like the he was like the Mitt Romney of principals. Like he was. <laughs> So, yeah, it, it's the best. All right, sorry, go on with your story. Oh, that guy was the, the Mitt Romney. This guy was like the Tobias Fugue of principles. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not even joking. <laughs> um, anyways, so he was stabbed in his office. They catch the kid down the block, right? Um, oh, the kid got out. That's good for that kid. <laughs> yeah. A security guard uh, that Gene and I actually were, uh, were acquainted with. Uh, who eventually goes down the red pill rabbit hole? We don't. Of course, with him. of course he yeah, does. But, what? He's but a fucking. Here, here's the thing. He's a fucking he, school fucking fucking security guard. He's. He I know. Could, I know. He couldn't even but make here, here, it. So I don't. You I, realize, I don't no. lose track of the story. Let me. Sorry. Right. <laughs> like he um, to his credit, at that time he catches up with the kid and just talks him down and walks him back until the police arrive. Good response, right? The principal was stabbed. When he was wearing that Letterman jacket, oh, that God. fucking stupid ass homemade bullshit saved his life. Wow! So that's hey, a, that's what amazing. do I know? It's amazing. Anyways, the only reason I bring that up is because if if our teacher had told us the principal got stabbed, I don't think many people would have calmed down anymore. Mm-hmm. And I think that was actually the a good call because okay. none of us were in any immediate danger. It was like the kid stabbed the principal because he that kid had a lot of problems in, in home life yeah, and yeah. stuff. And I, I hope he's doing better. He he was just trying to get out of that place. He didn't want to be there. Yeah, yeah. Um now here's the, the, the kicker to all this, which is not related to why I told the story, but now I need to say <laughs> it. Um you know, he, he takes like a month off and he heals up and stuff like that. He goes on the news because he's like all pumped up and on drugs in the hospital. He's like, I want to talk to Schwarzenegger. Oh, no. Talk about defense. It, the, uh, those clips might still be out there online. Oh, on my ABC God. Or something. Um, it was a private Catholic school. There's no reason why Arnold Schwarzenegger should have been involved. Yeah. Um, but um, he is not asked to return the following year <laughs> for, for the job because he also just wasn't good at it. Yeah. It sounds like, like he wasn't. The, the fucking two two minutes you've talked to me, he was annoying and he got stabbed. So yeah, it was he, annoying. He got stabbed. Gene found his LinkedIn. I'm not gonna link it or anything like that. Okay, but he okay. found his LinkedIn and he was like, "That year is blank on his LinkedIn." Oh, uh, it is. Wow. It is private school advisor. Wow. <laughs> or something like that. So it's just like, yeah, that'd be a little embarrassing too. Oh, why'd you leave this position? I got stabbed. stabbed. You felt unsafe? <laughs> no, I wasn't asked back. <laughs> I mean, I would spin that shit. Like, I would just be like, yeah, I wanted to come back, but they wouldn't let me because I fought off my yeah. attacker. Like, I would make up a whole story. Yeah, just lie. <laughs> yeah, lying works. Just That's what Orson taught us. Yeah, I, I uh, mean, if if you're already rocking a Hitler mustache yeah. in what it, what must have been 2000, the late 2000s, <laughs> Like fucking guy, you're clearly bold. So fucking just lie. <laughs> can I tell just while we're on the subject? Can I tell my school attack story? Oh yeah. Um. Very. Yeah. This one's Go this one's a lot briefer, rails, so. a lot less, a lot less exciting than yours. But it's uh. So well, right. So like you had. So like they didn't tell you about the stabbing, right? Like I get like not being like there's a stabbing, blah, blah, blah. but when I went to school, we had something. I don't know if it still exists. I, I'm like I know there's active shooter drills, and I know a lot of it's changed. But when I was in school, we had something called Code C. Um, it was a Code C, which is would basically be like if someone comes over the announcement goes Code C, you're supposed to lock the classroom doors, turn off the lights, and then you have to get in a position where no one will be able to see you in the classroom from the window on the classroom door, right? Like you basically we all have to get in the corner, right? Um, mm-hmm. And we did, like, you know, it was, like, you do, like, fire drills every year. You do, like, two Code C drills every year. Um, and it was no big Like, it was just, like, one of those things. So, um, we're, we're sitting in class one day. Um, I think this is, I think it's maybe I'm fifth grade, maybe sixth grade. Uh, we're sitting in class. Uh, announcement comes on. And it's the front office. And it's a woman. And I'll, I'll try to imitate what it sounded like. And so it comes on and this woman goes, go see like that. Like, wait, sorry, what? Goes like, code C, like they can't breathe. 
like, <laughs> and then it just cuts off. And we're, so we're all like, the fuck? <laughs> but like, we have to do it. So we all get in the corner and like, we're there and it's like a few hours. Like we're like sitting there, like the fuck is going on? Like, and we all, you're supposed to stay quiet and you don't know. So, and I think they ended school half a, half a day early. Cause like, they just said like, fuck it. Um, but so here's, here's what happened. It's the dumbest thing ever. Um, so like a kid, some kid had drugs in their locker, right? Like some, so like they, they, they call the cops. The kid gets like brought, like they, they fucking, they bring the kid to the front office. I don't know what went down. Like, I don't know exactly what went down. I don't know if like the kid took a swing at someone or if something happened. But the long and short of it is that they, there's some sort of altercation happened and the cop just took his pepper spray out and just started spraying just like all over the front office and got everyone. And like it wasn't so the fucking fucking uh, secretary just panicked and said code C. Like and so that was all it ended up being. But we sat in like silence for hours waiting to hear what happened. And it was just a fucking incompetent cop just like spraying. Like <laughs> fucking guy couldn't bring down a middle schooler. Like <sighs> oh, uh, <shit>. Yeah. <laughs> isn't 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 school exciting? <laughs> you okay, Diego? <laughs> Did I lose your shit? Fuck. That was. <laughs> that might have broken me. You all right? I didn't realize it was that. I didn't realize it was that funny. <laughs> um, <clears throat> anything else insane? I think that was like the only time we had something like that. Like we had like a few like 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 people getting beat up, and someone brought like a knife to school once, but that was like a whole other thing. But like nothing ever like insane like that. I think happened. Um, so like the most the, the most damage anyone ever did to the school was a cop. <laughs> like, <laughs> so. Oh my god! Uh, there yeah. was a moment where I I physically couldn't breathe, oh, I'm sorry. and I felt like I didn't have control of I, my I, body from laughing. So I hard. was just I was just trying to recreate the experience of being in that front office. <laughs> god damn! Oh shit! That's what I was saying, like, with the <sighs> fucking security guard guy, like, of course he got red-pilled. Like, he's he couldn't even make it as, like, the, oh, the, yeah. the bar is so low for cops, he couldn't even make that, so he became a school security <laughs> guard. Like, it's just, of course that guy got red-pilled. But, uh, yeah. How did we get on this? What did, this, what did any of this have to do with Citizen Kane? Um, oh, I was, oh shit, had, I, I don't know anymore. Because I was comparing the teacher to not, um, not scaring us by telling us what's going on because there was there was enough safety like it was it was safe enough that he didn't have to like get us out of the building or anything like that you know yeah. what I mean? And you were saying Joe Biden can't say like oh, yeah. the economy's fucking so, shit and we can't so, it, pull it up through normal you, means. Can you imagine if Joe Biden like went on TV and just like openly weeped and was like we're fucked? So, like, yeah. it, would, it would, <laughs> He wouldn't be wrong, but it wouldn't help things. Yeah. <laughs> like, I feel like I'm coming across as like a Joe Biden defender. Fuck that guy. Like, I'm just like, I feel like just sometimes it's the Hillary Clinton thing of like where Hillary Clinton gets criticized for such dumb bullshit. And it's like, no, she's evil. Like, apart from that, like, I want to focus on yeah. the actual stuff she's doing bad. <clears throat> but yeah, it's like when, when like, like conservatives will start like tossing around like, like slurs towards her or stuff like that. It's like, well, no. Yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> I, I, I'm not with you there. Mm-hmm. He's just a bad politician. Happens to be a bad person too. It's like, did you know that? It's did not you know that, that complicated? Did you know that Hillary Clinton takes bribes on the side? And it's like, yeah, every single fucking person in our government does that. Like, she's not abnormal. Yeah, like, what the fuck? Like, she, you're, you're, there isn't a guy, there isn't a single person in fucking Washington who isn't doing that. <laughs> it's, I know it, it's it's fucking that's yeah. fucked up. Uh, none of this has anything to do with Citizen Kane. Well, no, uh, because of the corrupt. Um, what the fuck is that guy's name? 
Um, um, oh, Gettys, Jim Gettys. Jim Gettys has yeah. something less than a chance. The governor yeah. of New York. <laughs> we'll send you to Sing Sing Gettys. Sing Sing. It's a great moment in this movie. I mean, this movie is is the great moment. I mean, all and these guys were the first great moment. Also, like all these guys were people he just brought from the Mercury Theater, right? Like it's just all his dudes. Yeah. Like, <clears throat> uh. God, the fucking took the wind out of me. Uh, <laughs> but like, yeah, yeah, they're they're not like um, professionally trained like motion mm. picture actors. They're yeah, yeah, they're theater actors, and it's just like, I don't that that, that must have inspired like a sense of controversy. It was like, oh, yeah. you can't do that. Well, yeah, I mean, he, he, do, he basically does that with, like, this and Ambersons, and then they all kind of, like, break up, right? Like, they all kind of move on after that. I think Cotton is, like, kind of the only one. Joseph Cotton's kind of the only one that really stays in his orbit orbit for a long period of time. Um, like, I don't think they uh, they were ever directed again. But what was that? <laughs> I'm still just fucking laughing. That oh, was I'm so sorry. Funny. Oh, I'm no, sorry. Is, God damn, I really, I really did not mean to uh, do that. That was not my intent. No, it's fine. Um, no, it was, it was great. I hope, I hope was, everyone, um, I hope everyone else liked it. Um, I know. If no one else liked it, then it was like Jesus. He's he's really laughing a lot. Yeah. It's like no, I, I promise it's sincere. Oh, okay. Um, Isn't it great to know yeah, those this, are the people protecting our children at schools? <laughs> Fund the police. <laughs> yeah, this isn't even me being like a, a no, left wing nut job. I'm just it, like, you know, maybe just everyone take take time out. Tell, tell imagine, them to take time out. Imagine for look, like, that kid probably had fucking pot in his fucking locker, right? Like it was probably fucking marijuana. Imagine if that guy had reached for his gun. <laughs> <laughs> In that oh, situation, they should laugh at that. just like bang, 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 like <laughs> freaking, just spraying bullets, like ugh. this is this such a dumb society we live in? Ugh. Did you see that fucking guy get scared by the acorn falling out of the tree? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Like, imagine if there was, like, genuine danger. Like, what would that guy would have fucking shit his pants? Like, that's always the best when, like, they talk about these schools where, like, they have, like, the security guard there. And then, like, a shooting happens and the security guard just fucking runs. Like, it's happened so many times. Yep. Oh, there was, I think I can say this now. There was a teacher at that same high school who, um... Who was like, oh, yeah, I carry a gun with me on campus because you never know with all these shootings these days. Yeah. And then the administration found out and they're like, you can't no. Do that. Yeah, <laughs> you're not supposed to have guns on school property. A uh, separate year, but he was also asked to not return. Well, hey. Hey, uh, hey, also. Probably fucking, a good call. Fucking conspiracy alert. So, like, that, that shit goes down when I'm in fucking school. But we were a dare uh, drug free middle school. <laughs> So how did that kid get potted? Yeah. They had the sign up and everything. The little lion on the dare thing. Uh, remember dare? Remember how, it's, remember how we all took dare classes and we never did drugs ever? Yeah. Remember how it stopped everyone from doing drugs? Um, shout out to Abbott Elementary for doing their take on, on dare, which is called Fade. Oh, boy. Um, it... At the time of recording, the previous episode is has a handful of the most gut bustingly fucking hilarious <laughs> instances I've ever seen in television. <laughs> Can I ask you this? Um, Do you remember any of the lessons that like Dare tried to teach you that like were such bullshit? Like you, there were such obvious bullshit. Uh, no. But here's what I do remember: immediately when we were introduced to Dare at like those school assemblies mm -hmm. we would start making jokes about well it's a dare to do more drugs <laughs> it, it, it just busted it wide open you know like there's no coming back from that yeah. you lost it's yeah it's literally the fucking name someone should have workshop yeah. that for more than five minutes <laughs> but uh <laughs> like how did they not see that coming here was one we did that i remember um it was such bullshit so like the like 
we did like dare through like the whole year right and we had to have like dare graduations right like it was such yeah it's it's one of those like and people like think we're not propagandized to in this country like it's such nonsense but uh one of the things was we had a we had like a our dare book like you know like hey books for like your math class or your history class we had a dare book and then like, you would write in it and shit and one of the things that on the first day of class there were two hearts on like the front of it like two hearts in the first few pages and we had to shade them in with our pencils right mm-hmm. and it was like okay every day you are gonna on the left heart you're gonna you're gonna run your eraser through it once and on the right heart you're gonna run your pencil through it once and we're, at the end of the year we're gonna see how the hearts look right mm-hmm. and so you do that and it's like see look how the one on the left cleared up and the one on the right got darker. That's what cigarettes do if you keep smoking. <clears throat> Think about it, Diego. Think about it. The the, the nation's brightest minds. <laughs> the, your, your tax dollars at work. <laughs> um, wow. And Even that's a, why everyone does drugs in high school. No, you know, uh, don't you know, don't do drugs in high school. No, you know what was you know what was the here's what you do. Here's here's the two things. This here's this will genuinely end smoking and drug you and pot use. I can only do these two. I only know an answer for these two. One, find a smoker and just record them sleeping at night and all the hacking they do at night. That that'll that people give up smoking cigarettes overnight when they hear that when that's what they their future is going to be. The other is you take you got or first of all you got to make sure you got to get the kids early because you got to make sure they aren't doing drugs. So you got to get a bunch of sober children, and you take a Grateful Dead album, and you play them the Grateful Dead, right? <laughs> and then you say, kids, this music will sound good if you're high. <laughs> It will end drug use overnight across the country. Oh, I'm telling you, I can't, I can't, can't, can't do cocaine or heroin. I don't have answers for that one yet. But I can yeah. end pot use. I can definitely well, if end you're, if you're the devil that is pot use. <laughs> If you're scared of needles like I am, it's pretty easy to avoid heroin. Oh yeah, I guess that's I guess that's the one to do with heroin, like. <laughs> yeah, no, I, it it's pretty easy to avoid for me. Also, I I don't I just putting stuff into my body. It's not really uh, for me. It just it's it's weird. Um, even well, when I I got the COVID boosters and stuff, they're like, you know, relax your muscles. I'm like, you fucking relax. What the fuck? <laughs> like. <laughs> I could have taken your comment in a lot of different directions, but I'm not going to. I know, I know. I was and, like, wait a second. Like, I better, I better save this real oh, quick. Oh, so that's why I'm more susceptible to drug use. Oh, yes. <laughs> but, uh... Um, I was going to talk about the beautiful friendship between Joseph Cotton and Orson Welles, but I guess we moved okay. on. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. No, it was we just, can it wind was, down on that. Um, they're, they're, like, Joseph Cotton had, like, a stroke later in life, and it affected his speech, and, like, they would talk, uh, like, late in the hours, and, like, Joseph Cotton would, like, mix up his words, and Orson would be like, that's a much better word, Joe, I'm going to use it. Like, Aww. It's just that's just so sweet to do. And I guess uh, the story is Joseph Cotton sent the first uh, manuscript of his memoir to Orson to review. And Orson, like, wrote back and said it's great. And then Orson died, like, three days later. And so if if you've ever read Joseph Cotton's memoir, I believe in the last page it says something like, um, a manuscript of this book is in his possessions. Like, something like that. Mm. So... Well, a few people, because, like, Orson famously did not maintain lifelong friendships. (laughs) But, uh... So at least at least there was that one. At least he had one. Um, yeah, that's good. So yeah, um, Citizen Kane? Question mark. Citizen Kane. Um, you know what? Kind of overrated. Fuck this movie. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, like, look, we we did talk ar- around the movie, but like, look, how much more could we we have yeah. added? Just fucking watch it. Movie? Like, literally, you fucking no. Yeah, literally There's pterodactyls in it. one scene. I will say um, one thing that I found funny. This was not on the most recent watch, but I wanted to recently was uh, we literally Citizen Kane 
um, I don't know, I don't know why I keep calling him Citizen Kane. It's Charles Foster Kane, but um, anyway, Citizen Kane. Uh, it's he easier. does he does the whole like Declaration of Principles thing, and then it's like literally like a scene later. He has a whole song and dance number choreographed in his honor. <laughs> like <laughs> it's like his his fall is pretty quick in a lot of ways, <laughs> um, but. Uh, it's great, great. You fucking movie. buy it. Yeah. So it's it's a great movie. Um uh, basically every other Orson Welles movie is a failed blockbuster or failed award. Contender. Yeah, I think that's really the reason we're doing this is just to open the door to basically do his entire filmography. Like, so if you want to know how many seasons, how many more seasons this is gonna last, it's gonna be one, <laughs> two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. 13. So we got 13 more years of this, Diego. 13 available? Like, we could actually sit down and watch? <laughs> yeah, that's. I think that's pretty much it. Um, okay. I guess filming Othello is the one that's, like, hard to get. But, like, like I think they just announced that, like, they're finally restoring it or something. Oh, no, the Criterion right. put it out a few years ago. So, um, so yeah. But... I guess we could just do do this. I guess we could just do filming Othello with Othello. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Fuck. If we do get to the other side of the wind, that would be. Yeah. I would be so happy because I I still love that. I called that the best movie of the 2010s. It is is great. Which is is maybe a a cheat, but whatever. Yeah. It is great. Like, it is genuinely like, you know, you wait. And sometimes you're like, well, what is. Like, even if it's good, it's not going to be relevant to today. And it's like, oh my God. It's like so. It still (laughs) works today. Like, just insane. It's one of those where, like, you wonder what would have happened had it been released in his lifetime, right? Mm-hmm. Like, there's like a, there's always that, there's that quiet hope he could have fucking got his shit together, right? Um, yeah. And then he could have finally, um, he could finally get Don Quixote made. Yeah. Yeah. Other side of the wind. Uh, edited by Bob Morosky, editor mm-hmm. of the Sam Raimi Spider-Man trilogy, and Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness. <laughs> that might explain some things about that movie. Yeah. No wonder I made the Sam Raimi connection. <laughs> well. Uh, yeah, the Citizen Kane. It's crazy that Peter Bogdanovich, like, like did the voiceover for the other side of the wind and then died. Well, he, he hung in there for a couple more years. He hung in there for uh, basically three more years. Yeah, see? That's, that's a that's small, nothing. that's that's still a small window. <laughs> it's, it is a small window, yes. He also um, found time to be in uh, It Part 2, or whatever. Yeah. Well, that's because uh, Paper Moons is one of that director's favorite movies. I don't I, know how or why, but it well, is. Well, you, you can totally see it in that film. <laughs> when the fucking, when they play the music when he, when the when monster pukes all over the guy. That's, touch, that's such a Paper Moon touch. Anyways, Matt, thanks for joining me. Wasn't that um, wild though? Were you in the theaters where you were like watching like it chapter two and you're like, is that fucking Peter Bogdanovich? <laughs> <laughs> I was in the theater going like, this might be the worst movie I've ever seen in a theater. Oh, did you are you already made up that choice by then? Yeah. Well, no, no, that happens pretty early, huh? No, 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 no. Yeah, I, I wasn't. Uh, probably I- by the. 45 minute mark that that makes that makes sense oh shit this is like this is one of the worst things ever yeah it's not good what was that it makes me like the first one less and i didn't already love that one yeah that was one where like i think we all gave the first one a pass because it like didn't suck right and then it was like the next one came out and you're like you know what no yeah well don't worry there's a television to direct the flash oh yeah that worked out really well yeah and then he's in line to do a Batman movie. Yeah, that's really gonna happen. No, don't worry. He's uh, I. He might be announced as being off by the time this episode. Although, even what comes is out, going so. on over there in terms of the battle between like that and the Batman Part Two? Uh, I don't know, but I'm getting a little concerned, frankly. Yeah, because I just rewatched the Matt Reeves Batman. That that's a good movie. It's a good it's a movie. Good movie. It's actually good. Um. If yeah. you ignore the fact that Batman is, like, the worst detective ever in it. But, like, other than that, it's good. No, no, because that's what all those fucking old detective stuff were like. All the detectives suck. 
<laughs> no, Diego. That's that's what Matt Reeves said. That's Die- what Matt Reeves said. Diego, I love you, but like fucking. <laughs> no, no, I don't actually believe that. Wait, wait. I thought you knew he said that. All right. Well, Matt Reeves. That's a that's a take. We might be talking listen, about Matt Reeves. Listen, listen. You make a future. movie that good, you can say whatever the fuck you yeah. want. Well, you, the reason that movie's good is just because the penguins in it. Like fucking Colin Farrell penguin rules. Oh yeah. I'm Oz. The Wobbler Espanol fellas. Oh, yeah. What are you showing me? Come on. Yeah. Oh, he's got to be in all of them. Yeah, they, I, I hope, hope they do that. Well, they're doing the Penguin show, right? Yeah, which I think Reeves also wrote on. And they should. Like, he, he definitely sh- produced it, but I, I he should he fight people like the big guy in John Wick 4. Oh, that would be awesome. If, if he did that, then it would be the greatest TV show of all time. Yeah. It'd be like, fuck the wire. Yeah. It's the Penguin TV yeah. show. <laughs> All right, that's Citizen Kane. That's Citizen Kane, Thanks, everyone. everyone for listening. Um, um, next week we'll be back with. We already talked about it. Michael Mann's Ferrari. It's it's going to be hysterical when we eventually do the whale, and it's like four times longer than the Citizen Kane episode. <laughs> like we will do the whale Look, eventually. I'll be honest. I I don't. We will. I don't know if I'll ever have that much to say about a Darren Aronofsky movie. I, it's not y- called Noah. You might not, but I do. <laughs> okay. Well. I, well, look, every, for Brendan Fraser, I'll do a lot. Every now and then, I got to steamroll you. There you go. Oh, just every now and then. Yeah, I did kind of one up your story earlier. That was kind of a dick move on my part. I didn't no, mean you to do did. That. But that's okay. I, I don't remember the last time I laughed that hard on a podcast. All right, I'm glad I made it up for that. I shouldn't have done that. I should have let. No, that, no, that that's stabbing. <laughs> that stabbing story is really. What funny. was it? Code three. <laughs> It's code Z, code C, <laughs> as in like I like I, I think it's just supposed to be like it's supposed to sound like not like nondescript like so it's not like they're going like active shooter so like to alert someone or something but it's just it's just code C and so you know, and I hear a distressed woman's voice come over the announcements and just go code C. Like she's being strangled live on the air, and then waiting and then finding out it was an incompetent cop the whole time. It was a, it's a, it's an experience. <coughs> much, much like Citizen Kane. Yes, much like Citizen Kane. It, it was um, the it was the sled the whole time. Oh yeah, it's a fucking ass Family Guy. It was a sled. It's the name of the sled. <laughs> Just saved you two boobless hours. Um, uh, when the Seth other... McFarlane's on, he's on. Yeah, the other good one is uh, when they watched it on The Sopranos in the home theater. And Adriana is <laughs> like, so it was his sled? He should have told somebody. <laughs> did you know that? Uh, did you know that fucking Spielberg owns the sled? I think we've talked about that before, and that makes a lot of sense. It's. Do you think he's ever thought about that? Do you think before he's ever the thought Fablemans? of? No. After the Fablemans? <laughs> yes. Do you think is is, <laughs> is like Tony Kushner has ended up being like the great Spielberg collaborator of the last decade? Do you think Tony uh-huh. Kushner is like is he a great writer or is he just in Spielberg's life being like? Steven. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> like <laughs> Is he just is he just the first guy willing to point out the obvious? He might be. Because Spielberg probably has that, that George Lucas type thing where it's like he's too revered, mm-hmm. so people can't tell him no, because it's like, well clearly he knows what to do. That would be my mistake. If I ever met Spielberg, I would like tell it like it is to his face, and then I would never work in Hollywood. <laughs> I don't know. Um, him and other people talked about Gabriel LaBelle in the Fable Men's. He was like, it wasn't just some kid being like, like reverential to Spielberg. It was like, hey, I th- what do you think about me doing it like this? I-, I think it would be like more interesting if I tried this approach to this scene. And Spielberg was like, no child actors ever talked to me that way before. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, hey, it worked out because it's a great fucking movie and a great fucking performance. Yeah. He he owns. We'll have he, to do Fablemans at some he, point. He owns the sled, Diego. I know, I know, I know. Like, it's, I like, I see it. 
we just, I get it. <laughs> we gotta like we can't not acknowledge that he owns the actual sled. <laughs> <laughs> But now, every time I think of Tony Kushner, I will think of him saying that in his voice, like, Steven. (laughs) (laughs) Steven. It's like, what? It's a sled. (laughs) I like like the movie (laughs) Citizen Kane. You know, he wanted the sled. I got it. It's like, Steven. (laughs) Tony Kushner goes over. He's like, hey, so why why did you give uh, Kate Blanchett that haircut in Indiana Jones 4? Like, oh, I don't know. Is that a picture of your mother on the wall? Yeah, why? No reason. <laughs> it, it would be funny if that, if that Spielberg is just these... I mean, there is that clip of him on fucking Inside the Actor's Studio where fucking what's-his-name Lipton is like, hey, did you ever notice that uh, the ending of Close Encounters, uh, it mixes technology with uh, music, which were your parents' two loves? And Spielberg's like, oh, I never realized <laughs> Oh, but that's such a sweet movie. Clip, no, though. no, no, no. It's it is, is it is sweet, but it is one of those things being like, oh, that's really sweet. How old are you, Stephen? Uh, uh, you you ever think about that a little bit? Look, look, we don't ha- we are not going to have that much more time with him. I just no, no, no. I am, I am not, him. and I, we like, should get more introspective about it. I'm just not putting that on him at no, this he, point. No, he, he did, he did the right thing, which is to wait for both of his parents to be dead before making the Fablemans. <laughs> like oh, that was, yeah, yeah. that was the, that was the smart move. But it is one of those things where, like, he's gotten like the Fablemans is an is such a revealing film. It is one of those where you're like, you wonder how much of that has he has he been thinking about his whole life, and how much of it is he was in COVID and it was like the first time in like 40 years he got reflective. (laughs) Maybe Um, it's one of his few screenplay credits. Yeah. I mean, what is, what are his, his, his screenplay credits are like, it's the Fablemans. It's like AI, right? Like he wrote AI, right? I think he did. Yeah. He wrote the screenplay for AI, which is crazy. That's fucking insane. Um, and then I, th- he has a writing credit on Close Encounters, I think, but like other people like helped him with that one. Um, but that is the other one, I think. Oh, technically so, the Goonies. Yeah, but the, the Goonies is the fucking Goonies. I, yeah, I didn't want to go back there, but I yeah. think the Goonies was literally him being like, What if I found a pirate ship? They were like, Good enough. <laughs> like, <laughs> uh, Poltergeist, but that's a whole other thing. Yeah. That, I don't, I don't follow one way or the other anymore. <laughs> on the Spielberg, or it, on the Wikipedia, for uh, under Spielberg, where it like lists all his movies and the TV shows he's worked on and all that shit. Um, for film characters created, there are only two Wikipedia pages. Can you guess which two characters have Wikipedia pages? Indiana Jones. Nope. E.T. E.T. Then who's the other one? That's right, Sammy Fableman. Wow. There's an entire Wikipedia page dedicated to Sammy Fableman. <laughs> Age, 7 to 18 years old. <laughs> Religion, <laughs> Judaism. That's someone uh his former his former residency is Phoenix, Arizona. <laughs> Thanks, Wikipedia. Well, that was also the Fablemans now. Yeah. And Whoop. Citizen Kane. Yeah. Are, is Happy Amblin, are we just going to take Happy Amblin out back and shoot it? I want to do more. Uh, yeah. I we, really do. Well, here's the thing. What's, what's stopping us is uh, we want to do more Spielberg stuff because he, he has done failed blockbusters and failed awards contenders, but we can't do them while we're while we might do Happy Amblin, <laughs> so. What what if we, like, oscillate? Here's like, what not we... between those series, but between, like, his movies and Adam Sandler movies in the failed blockbusters versus a failed award contender. Maybe we'll know, make... Like, in maybe, between those seasons. Maybe we'll make the Sandler things, like, goals on Patreon. Like, anytime we get a certain oh, level, yeah. we'll do another Sandler. Okay. And then we can then we can oh, just you know do what? This, this might stuff. give us an excuse to skip over Schindler's list because you know what? Quite frankly, we are not qualified to talk. We're about not qualified movies. to talk about Schindler's list. 
Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't know if I don't know if my tangents about insane things that have happened to me would fit very well um, while discussing the Holocaust. Yeah, I, I feel like we will not do that subject matter justice. That mm-hmm. that's a, a little out of our wheelhouse. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, <laughs> I feel like that covers it. Yeah, yeah. I think I think that I think the. I mean, well, the other one we don't want to do is, like, Amistad. <laughs> oh, yeah. Which is, like, a bad movie, too. You know what? We might skip, uh, you know, Mess with the Zohan while we're at it. Yeah. I think he's, like, an IDF member in that. Well, that was the uh, breaking Sam point, Hamlet. honestly. That was the moment where I'm like, we're never doing Happy Ambly again. <laughs> Uh, let's... Anyways, Matt, thanks for joining no, me on no this one, episode. That... No one ask Adam Sandler what he thinks about Israel. <laughs> yeah, no, we're good. We're good. I we're threw good. on Just, a um, random make, curb. Make... I, re- I threw on a random curb your enthusiasm episode. It was that weird pro-Israel episode. Uh, which one is that? I haven't seen all of it. There's uh, it's oh, I can't remember what season. It's the one where there is a like a Palestinian restaurant opens up. Palestinian so, chicken. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And it's like, they, the, the they're all like, um, it's crazy. Their chicken's so good, even though they hate all Jews. And it's like, well, I'm not sure if that's, that's how that works, but, um, <laughs> well, now yeah. is that him saying that? Or is that the character? saying? Well, that? that's the, that's the thing, but I, I'm pretty sure that's an episode. Cause then also he ends up in a relationship with a Palestinian woman who just wants to have sex with them because she hates Jews so much. <laughs> Jesus Christ. So, Larry. <laughs> Larry, what are you doing? Whenever whenever Curb is on and my dad's watching it in the other room, I will hear him and he will just be saying, Larry, what are you doing? <laughs> so, what are we doing? Let's fuck let's wrap this up. Let's fucking wrap this up. Orson would have been um, amazing on Curb. You're going to break the time, like, space continuum with a thought that powerful. Well, here's the thing, Orson, we were so, like, Orson should have been immortal, because we were deprived of so much Orson shit that would have been amazing. Of, like, Orson hanging in for, like, even just ten more years, right? Like. Do you think he would ever do an episode of Seinfeld? Um, okay, who would he have been? Elaine's dad. No, because, Lauren, you can't take that away from Lauren's tyranny. But I think you could take a lot away from Lawrence Tierney. I think he should have been the Including voice the bottle. I think he should have been the voice of the Bubble Boy because we never see him. That that might solve like world <laughs> hunger. Yeah, it would have been amazing. But then, like, he could have done like a really shitty. All right, what do you? Here's here's the here's the question. Would he have ever We're never been? End this episode. Would he have been a guest? appearance on uh star trek the next generation like what do you like popped up in an episode as like a fucking klingon or some shit or could he not have gotten on there and would have had to been on like farscape (laughs) oh god maybe farscape i don't know because i'm thinking like this was enterprise but like the rock guest starred as a klingon yeah in enterprise you know yeah so I'm like, if you're doing stunt casting, I don't know about next gen, but maybe there, one of the other ones. The other one I always talk about is that there was that there's that era of FMV video games where they would get like celebrities to be in them, right? And like those games suck. We were so deprived of Orson Welles in an FMV video game. Oh my god. Like he pops up on screen like or like, you know, like Command and Conquer. Yeah. And, like, you fool, you think your forces can defeat me? Like, <laughs> yeah, that's exactly what I was thinking of. Just, it would have been, we, 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 we were, we've, we've been robbed. Like, it's, we, we missed out so much on it. We're but, going to the one place that hasn't been tainted by capitalism. Right. Space. <laughs> That hasn't been corrupted by frozen peas. <laughs> <laughs> Mrs. Buckley Although, <laughs> although you, you, you kind of can't take that away from uh, what's-his-face either. Uh, Tim Curry. Tim Curry is like the master Curry, of it. Yeah. But, but I'm saying there could have been something yeah. equivalent to it. 
that would have been mm-hmm. amazing. I'm just or like he doesn't even have to be an antagonist. He's just be cut from being like agent. It is your mission to fucking. You know, right? And it's cl- like he can have a paper <laughs> in his hand that he's reading the lines from as he's doing it. <laughs> He's in the middle of editing Don Quixote, and they just they they just roped him in to do this. Oh, oh it could have been like Xehanort or something. Yeah. Kingdom Hearts. Oh my god! Oh my <laughs> god! Orson in Kingdom Hearts, man. Oh my god! <laughs> I mean, it it, it, it would react to. Oh, uh, it's it's one of those where like. Because it's the thing of like he would have done a good job, but then he would give an interview somewhere, being like, "Fucking bullshit! I don't even know what it is." Fucking Mickey Mouse nonsense. Fucking. But now, uh, in the first game, I am an antagonist to Mickey Mouse and his companions. But in the second game, it is revealed that there is another me, and now I am one of their compatriots. I am a nobody I think that's what in this happens, version. Right? I'm a nobody. Just like my career, <laughs> thanks to fucking David O. Selznick. <laughs> <It's> just... <laughs> they've had they've had their hearts taken by the heartless, where I have had mine ripped out by the studio system. <laughs> Rest in peace, Orson. Thank Rest you for peace, your incredible Orson. library of work and endless memes that we share back and forth. On Rest in peace, media. Orson, who would have loved nothing about the 21st century. <laughs> <laughs> Rest in peace, Orson Welles, who maybe would have loved TikTok. I don't know. We're not going down that rabbit hole. I, I don't even know how to begin to process that possibility. Uh, Matt, thanks for joining me. Uh, thanks, everyone, for listening. Thanks for Orson, watching. Like and subscribe. Orson. If you, if you like this episode, like and subscribe. Bowser you might find something you do like. In the Super Mario Brothers movie. Jesus Christ. Him as Bowser. Jack Black fucking kills. He's the one good person in that movie. Yeah. You're talking about the animated one. Right? All right, then he's Donkey Kong. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that works. You useless plumber. <laughs> Uh, links down to everything below and everything mentioned. There's uh, Citizen Kane. Fucking Google. Actual, yeah, it like, was a mistake. It movie. was it was a mistake to do this episode. I'm just gonna say. No, it, no, we have, I don't think it we have, was. We have I really nothing don't. to add. First, no, it's... because okay, so there was this whole like struggle trying to get a recording time today because there's all this other bullshit. Nothing crazy, just stuff today. Yeah, it's and almost it midnight like, where I'm at. So I know, I, and I was like, God, maybe we should like try to figure something else out. But no. No, I, I do not regret doing this episode whatsoever. This was mm-hmm. totally worth it. Thank you for joining me. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, for... See you next week. Yeah. <laughs> Is that the end? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah that, that's the end. Goodbye. Here, uh, under, here under protest is beef burgers. <laughs> <laughs> we have been professionally unprofessional. <laughs>